Hello Year 9, back for some more Much Ado About Nothing. Today we're going to be looking at the scene where uh, Benedict gets uh, fooled. Don Pedro is putting his plan into action, which if you remember is to get him together with Beatrice. Um, can you make a list of uh, the things that uh, that um, Benedict's list of qualities in his ideal woman? Um, just make a list there for five minutes. Our learning objective today is to explore the character of Benedict in more detail. So the title is Exploring Benedict's Character. That goes into your book, obviously. And these are the things you're going to need. A copy of the extract from Act 2, Scene 3, which I will attach to class charts. Uh, you need access to YouTube. Um, and there's, a, there's a scene summary there on that link there in the, in the kind of yellowy box. And some different coloured pens and highlighters. Uh, by the way, actually, if, if your book, if you're coming to the end of your book, um, don't don't get right to the end. Just uh, drop me an email and I can get one sent out to you. We get it delivered to you. Anyway, uh, I want you to watch this clip from Act Two, Scene Three. Benedict overhears um, the uh, Don Pedro, Leonardo, etc., uh, talking um, and sort of uh, conning him. Gulling is the term. Uh, is the contemporary term. So I want you to write your first impression about this scene. Which bits made you laugh? Comedy through knowledge, dramatic irony. Now I know you know what dramatic irony is because we've um, we've discussed it. Do you remember the Jaws poster we looked at, or the two Jaws posters? But I want you to uh, write this definition into your books nonetheless. Uh, dramatic irony is a literary technique originally used in Greek tra tragedy by which the full significance of a character's words or actions is clear to the audience or reader, although unknown to the character. So basically it's the audience knowing more than the character does. Um, in this scene, dramatic irony is created because we, the audience, are in on the plan to trick Benedict. While he is surprised and shocked at what he hears, we know it's coming so we can see the humour in it. Works a bit like a pantomime. He's behind you and all that sort of uh, malarkey. Write down at least one example of how comedy created in this scene, how comedy is created in this scene through dramatic irony. Um, there's a list of them there, but you should be able to find one of your own. That won't take you more than five minutes. An aside, comedy through knowledge, an aside is a sort of um, a technique that kind of feeds into dramatic irony. So write this um, de definition into your books as well. An aside is a dramatic device in which a character speaks to the audience. By convention, the audience is to realise that the character's speech is unheard by the other characters on stage. So it's when a character sort of turns to the audience and addresses the audience and we suspend disbelief sufficiently that in terms of the story, the other characters on the stage uh, can't hear him. An aside is usually a brief comment rather than a speech, such as a monologue or a soliloquy. So um, monologues and soliloquies are, are quite long. An aside is just like one or two phrases. Uh, so copy that into your books, that, uh, that definition. Asides also create dramatic irony because they provide the audience with additional information to the other characters on stage. In this scene, asides are used to show interactions between some of the characters but not others. Write down at least one example of how dramatic irony created in this scene is created in this scene through asides. And there's some there for you to uh, look at, but see if you can find one of your own. If you can't, just copy those down. That's five minutes, then on to the next slide. Setting a trap, the language of hunting. Read through Act 2, Scene 3, focusing on Claudio's asides in particular. Find as many examples as you can that show the language associated with hunting, e.g. traps and fishing, etc. So it's just stop the, the, the lesson here and do that task. That's five minutes. Right, setting a trap, convincing Benedict. Make notes on how the men trap him. How do they describe Beatrice's behaviour? They make it sound like Beatrice is in a really emotional state and Benedict needs to save her. This appeals to a ma masculine desire to rescue a damsel in distress. She'll be up 20 times a night and there she will sit in her smock till she have writ a sheet of paper, my daughter tells us all. Oh, she tore the letter into a thousand halfpence and been so angry at herself that she should to write to one that she, would, that one that she knew would humiliate her. 
What does Don Pedro say about the way that he feels about Beatrice? I would she had loved me. I would have knocked back all other women and married her. That's a phrase that's carried into, into modern life, isn't it? Knocked back. Um, they make it sound like other men are interested. Competition also means Benedict sees the value of Beatrice. So they're making him think that other men are pursuing her. Therefore, he better sort of get in there quickly. Why doesn't Benedict think that it is a trick? Leonardo's involved. I should. I, Leonardo's involved. He's a wise old man, not someone who would trick others. I should think this is a trick, but that the white-bearded fellow speaks it. He is too old to be wicked. So there we are. Five minutes for that. Benedict's change of heart. He completely changes his mind now, although we knew that he liked her really. Now that he now that he thinks um, that she likes him, he's completely uh, completely changed his mind on the whole situation. And this is his uh, little speech after. This can be no trick. The conference was sadly born. They have the truth of this from Hero. They seem to pity the lady. It seems her affections have their full bent. Love me? Why it must be requited. I hear how I am censured. They say I will bear myself proudly. If I perceive the love come from her, they say too that she will rather die than give any sign of affection. I did never think to marry. I must not seem proud. Happy are they that hear their detractions and can put them to mending. They say the lady is fair. Tis a truth. I can bear them witness. And virtuous, tis so. I cannot reprove it. And wise, but for loving me, by my troth, it is no addition to her wit, nor no great argument of her folly, for I will be horribly in love with her. I may chance have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me, because I have railed so long against marriage, but doth not the appetite alter? A man loves the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall quips and sentences and these paper bullets of the brain awe a man, awe a man from the career of his humour? No, the world must be peopled. When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I were married. Right. Well, Benedict's left on stage alone while he, uh, he says that, just at the start of this scene where he described his ideal woman, we have a soliloquy. See how many of Benedict's list of ideal qualities for an ideal woman are repeated in this soliloquy. There we are. So get those notes and annotations into your books and on to the next slide. Right, I want you to uh, watch this clip, oh, but only up to uh, 1 minute and 11 uh, seconds. We'll do the next scene next time. Here Beatrice and Benedict are speaking at cross purposes, which means they don't fully understand what the other person's talking about or why they're behaving in the way that they are. Benedict thinks that Beatrice loves him, but Beatrice has no idea why he's suddenly behaving differently. Dramatic irony. It creates a lot of comedy in this moment. Compare how they behaved uh, with one another in this moment to the first scene. Um, you don't need to write anything down. Just have a think about it, how they are in this scene to how they felt in the first scene, Act 1, Scene 1. Benedict. Here comes Beatrice. By the day, she's a fair lady. I do spy some marks of love in her. Enter Beatrice. Beatrice. Against my will, I'm sent to bid you come in to dinner. Benedict. Fair Beatrice, I thank you for your pains. Beatrice. I took no more pains for those thanks than you took pains to thank me. If it had been painful, I would not have come. Benedict. You take pleasure in the message? Beatrice. Yea, just as you may take upon a knife's point and troke a door with all. You have no stomachs in your... Fare you well. Exit. Benedict. Ha! Against my will I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. There's a double meaning in that. I took no more pains for those thanks than you took pains to thank me. That's as much as to say any pains that I take for you is as easy as thanks. If I do not take pity of her, I am a villain. I will go, I will go get her picture. Exit. Well, I mean, you look at those lines. Beatrice, is. there's nothing in those lines that would suggest that she likes uh, Benedict. But he's reading all these things into it because um, he thinks he knows better. As it says, it's a very awkward moment. OK, add these notes to yours. Uh, act one, scene one, how they were. Look, equals in a merry war, skirmish of wit. Act two, scene three, Benedict is nice to Beatrice, etc. So copy those two down, put at the top act one, scene one, and uh, the change in Beatrice and Benedict's relationship. This is where we are now in their relationship. Um, he thinks she's in love with him um, and she can't understand why he's behaving in the way that he is. Okay, now here's the task. Who is Benedict? Put that as a title. 
Write a paragraph exploring how Benedict is presented in this scene in contrast to earlier in the play. Use evidence from at least two scenes. Um, there's a challenge there. Consider how soliloquies mean the audience know more about him now. How has your opinion of him changed since Act 1, Scene 1? Um, that's just a challenge. You don't have to do that. But the paragraph is the part that I would like you to upload to, uh, to class charts for me to have a look at. And look, your work has been fantastic, um, Year 9. I'm really impressed. So keep it up. Do that paragraph. Send it to me and I will speak to you next time. Thank you.